I see? When all I see is a battle, you see my victory. When all I see is a mountain, you see a mountain. And as I walk through the shadows, your love surrounds me. belongs to you and every fear I lay at your feet I'll sing through the night oh God the battle belongs to you and if you are for me who can be against me For Jesus, there's nothing impossible for you. When all I see are the ashes, you see the beauty. Thank you, God. Oh, when all I see is the cross, God, you see the empty tomb. Who else would 
died for our redemption Whose resurrection means our rise There isn't time enough to sing of all you've done But I have eternity to try With a thousand hallelujahs Magnify your name, you alone deserve the glory, the honor, and the praise. Lord Jesus, this song is forever yours. A thousand hallelujahs and a thousand more. We sing praise. Oh, praise to the
Starting a new series this morning, continuing the gospel of Matthew. If you've been with us in the past couple of years, we are slowly walking through the gospel. Um, we have seen a number of different series take us through it. And this one in particular takes us to Matthew chapter 9 and chapter 10. And it asks the question, does my life matter? You'll notice on the side as well, if you have your journal with you this morning, we're on page 34 of your journals. So I'm going to read uh, the opening eight verses of Matthew chapter 9 and then a few verses in Matthew chapter 10 as we begin. So Jesus stepped into a boat, crossed over, and came to his own town. Some men brought to him a paralyzed man lying on a mat. When Jesus saw their faith, he said to the man, Take heart, son, your sins are forgiven. At this, some of the teachers of the law said to themselves, This fellow is blaspheming. Knowing their hearts, Jesus said, why do you entertain evil thoughts in your hearts, which is easier to say? Your sins are forgiven or to say, get up and walk. But I want you to know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins. So he said to the paralyzed man, get up, take your mat and go home. Then the man got up and went home. And when the crowd saw this, they were filled with awe and they praised God who had given such authority to man. Throughout Matthew chapter 9, there are many Stories of miracles in which Jesus does the impossible in moments. And then it takes us to Matthew chapter 10. Starting in verse 1, it says this. That Jesus called his 12 disciples to him and gave them authority to drive out impure spirits. To heal every disease and sickness. Then he names the 12 disciples in the upcoming verses. And it says, these 12 Jesus sent out with the following instructions. Do not go among the Gentiles or enter any town of the Samaritans, but go rather to the lost sheep of Israel. As you go, proclaim this message. The kingdom of heaven has come near. Heal the sick, raise the dead, cleanse those who have leprosy, drive out demons. Freely you have received and freely you give. Do not get any gold or silver or copper to take with you in your belts. No bag for the journey or extra shirt or sandals or a staff, for the worker is worth his keep. And we'll end there at verse 10. Let's pray this morning. Father, we offer this space to you, this conversation in Matthew chapter 9, and in a consideration of a question like, does my life matter? We just pray for protection on our hearts and minds, where the enemy would wish to sow discontent and lies. We pray just a protection of your spirit that would speak truth to our hearts exactly where we're at. Uh, we we want to know you more. We want to know what you have to say to us, and I just pray that we have our, our hearts softened to receive what you have. In Jesus' name. Amen. So there's a number of different studies, both anecdotal and objective, that consider this question, does my life matter? And often the refrain that's given in response, whatever the specific language is, it comes with a tone of hesitation. Well, uh, I, I guess so. Or, sure, I haven't really thought about it much. But there is an uncertainty that comes with this question. And wouldn't you say, when we hear that question for someone else, we believe it perhaps with a little more confidence. We think of another person and we ask that question and we want to say with confidence, with an assurance, yes, most certainly it does. So today... When we consider one of these universal questions, it's a question that everyone asks at one juncture or another. Does my life really matter? It's important to understand that you're not alone in considering this question. This question of calling, of vocation, of purpose, does my life matter? Is, is me and what I'm doing right now actually have an impact upon the world? Everyone is asking this question whether they hold a Christian faith or not. Statistics show that in the last number of years, this question has increased in frequency. There's an index called the Canadian Index of Well-Being, and in 2020, they found that purpose was vital to well-being. This is not an abstract idea or something that might surprise you. But more particularly, it it was noted that it mitigates stress, it contributes to resilience, and it's essential for mental health. 72% of Canadians who said they felt purposeful also reported high levels of life satisfaction. There's a correlation between the two. And I think we inherently know this. We know this by default to some degree, but it's different sometimes to even hear that correlation, that purpose is tied to satisfaction. Purpose is tied to my wellness in life. 
It even noticed, noted that as we get older, we report that volunteering, community involvement, having purpose helped individuals to feel like their lives had more meaning and worth. In a world that often feels like a relentless race for success, status, or even just self-preservation, it's easy to wonder if our lives have any true significance beyond the day-to-day grind. And this question is a profound and deeply personal one. And each of us have a craving for having our life mean actually something. Throughout the Gospel of Matthew, Jesus meets his followers in their questions, offering not simply answers, but an invitation of a new way of living. And it's so transformative, this new way of living, that early Christians became simply known as followers of the way. And in this way, true life comes paradoxically, not by clinging to it, but by giving it away. Matthew 10, verse 39 says, Whoever finds their life will lose it. Whoever loses their life for my sake will find it. You'll notice in our journal, there's a a poem that's provided on the opening uh, dialogue for this series. And it comes from an individual by the name of David Gate. And he says this, and I think it beautifully captures the idea and our question. Sacrificial love remains the best way to transform our world. But for it to work, you have to first believe your life is something worth giving away. Being able to answer this question is not simply so you don't feel bad about yourself, but so that you can live out who God has designed you to be. Do you believe your life matters? Is there something worth giving away? So we return to the Gospel of Matthew, and we're looking at chapter 9 and 10, exploring these miracles, these metaphors, and the mission that God presents. And this pilgrimage through the Scriptures invites us to consider not just the value of life in general, but the unique worth of your life. And so today we're going to consider calling, purpose, and living in God's power. So I want to enter into the text together. Imagine standing in the crowd of a bustling town. There's noise, there's movements, people everywhere, merchants are selling goods, children are playing, voices are talking over one another, it's a busy space. And then amidst the commotion, you hear stories of a man who moves through the streets with an extraordinary authority. Not just in what he says, but in what he does. He heals the broken, he touches the untouchable, and he challenges the powerful, all with a calm certainty that points beyond himself. His actions speak louder than his words, and this is what it looks like when we see God's power at work in the world. It's the story of Jesus not just standing on a hill communicating paradigms to a people, but demonstrating it in the life and ministry that he has engaged in on an ongoing basis from the moment he said yes to the call of God upon his life. And as we look at Matthew 9 and 10, we see Jesus moving through towns and villages, and he's driven with this deep sense of purpose. And there's not just a purpose, but a posture that he has taken that I think is really vital for us to consider. These these are chapters that are riddled with those red letter words of Jesus. He forgives first and then he heals a paralyzed man. He breaks down the walls of the physical and the spiritual. Then he raises the dead. He heals the blind and he frees those who are trapped in darkness. Jesus does this with an authority that was beyond what people had ever seen. And finally, in Matthew 10, after doing all of these things that were incredible, he does something perhaps even more spectacular, and he commissions his disciples to go out and do something radical themselves. He shares the very power that he has demonstrated in word and action. And he commissions his disciples to go out and do the very same things he does. It's as if he's saying... This power isn't just for me, it's for you too. This mission, this call belongs to you. And I actually love that within Matthew chapter 10, he doesn't just say that as this broad statement, but he names, it names the disciples. 
person by person, as if to say that call is, is broad in nature, but it's specific to you. And I want us to hear that this morning as well. We're saying this call that God has given to us, but know that it is specific to you as well. And we can even name very simply that the same power that Jesus operates with, you are called to live with. This is the calling given to the followers of Jesus. And he has not left us unequipped. The gift of the Holy Spirit operates within those who call him Lord. And this is a gift that we're invited to live into every single day. And it's easier said than done. But when we look at the life of Jesus, I believe we're given a posture of how to live into this very power. So what does this mean for us today? It means that God's power is not distant. It's not an abstract force, but a reality that has been handed to us, entrusted to us as part of our calling. Your life matters. It means that we're invited to step into a story that's bigger than, our st- bigger than ourselves. A story of healing, of restoration, of the impossible. Not because of who we are, but because of who God is. To, to live in God's power is to embrace a life where we are not just bystanders to divine action, but participants. The kingdom of God is breaking into the world. And the gospel of Matthew is saying this over and over again. For then and for now. So we consider this question, does my life matter? And here, here's the thing that often comes whether it's in Christian circles or not, that when we consider a question like this, language like calling and purpose and vocation, it can all seem to just mesh together and feel the same or, or ambiguous. And the more ambiguous something often feels, the less likely we are to actually interact with it. It can be difficult to capture what's actually taking place between language like vocation and purpose and calling all seemingly in the same lane, but it's conflated to be the same, but it's not. And I want want to say this right off the bat, that we are called to do things, but we are saved by grace. And it's from grace that we are called. It is from his grace that we are purposed. It is from his grace that we do work. So let's think about it this way. Uh, there is this incredible organization that's doing incredible work. Uh, and an invitation has been given, but there's lots to learn about the company. And in order to live fully into that invitation, to work well in the organization, we need some information. There, there is some clarity required in our calling that provides us consistent direction as we move forward. Calling in the Greek comes from this word klesis, and it's actually meaning the idea of, divine, of invitation. In the Bible, calling means divine invitation. But specifically, on a broader sense, it is a divine invitation to a relationship with God and participation in his redemptive work. This is the call for everybody. It is being summoned by God to live in alignment with his will, which includes this general call to follow Jesus. In, in some cases, a specific call in a particular mission or task. But we need to hear this general call first. And this is the call to all believers to simply be this, hear this, a rela- to be in relationship with Jesus and living a life that reflects the way of Jesus and the values of the kingdom of God. This is your call, my call as a follower of Jesus. Sometimes we want our calling to to be so much more and so much more specific. But first we need to hear this call at the forefront. Why? Because sometimes we replace the end goal as the ultimate thing in which we're trying to live our life for, at no matter the cost. Hear me on this. Compromise of kingdom values for kingdom purposes is not the kingdom way. 
First Peter 2 verse 9 says, You are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's special possession, that you may declare praises of him who called you out of darkness and into the light. The declaration of our praises, the declaration of our heart that would give honor and glory to him is in the following of Jesus in such a way that it reflects the person of Jesus, that follows the kingdom way of Jesus. If we are somehow living a life because we say, my calling is to do something for God, and it causes us to compromise living like the one that we are looking to pursue, then we are not walking in the way of Jesus. We're walking in the way of man. We have to hear ourselves in the process. And I understand sometimes it can be really well-intentioned. That I believe I, have a, I, I matter in this world and I have a purpose. And we get so caught up in the final objective that we believe is the purpose that God set before us. And we lose the heart of Jesus on the way. We lose the posture that Jesus demonstrates in the scriptures over and over and over again. This does not mean that we are weak and feeble in the process of living life. But it means we are bold and courageous and founded in the person of Jesus in the life that we choose to live. To compromise that is not to actually follow our calling. So this general calling supersedes any specific calling you may feel called towards. Tim Keller, he highlights that biblical understanding of calling is always tied to a response to God's initiative. It is God who calls and our primary calling is to be in relationship with him. Now, specific calling certainly happens. Moses was called to lead Israel. It's Nexus chapter 3. And Paul was called to be an apostle to the Gentiles, Galatians 1, 15 to 16. And even in our, our passage, one of the more controversial pieces that sometimes can capture people's imagination in a different way is the disciples are called very specifically to go to the people of Israel. It feels exclusive to some degree. I don't want you to hear that as an exclusive call to all people, that Jesus put a wall up and he said, it's only these guys that get to come in. But it was a call specifically to his disciples in the stage that they were at, in the season that they were at, to go to the people that they were with. Because not too long after, we hear Paul speak specifically about his call to the Gentiles. In Galatians 1, 15 to 16, he notes that that was the call that was placed upon his life. But in all of it, relationship with God remains primary. And so if our Broad call, our general call kind of sits out on these edges and it kind of overlaps or uh, is an overview of everything. Then we ask the question of vocation next. Uh, what is the specific thing that I'm supposed to do within this call? A specific work that is assigned to us. Now the word vocation is derived from the Latin term vocatio and it's historically referred to just simply specific tasks, roles, and work that God assigns to individuals as part of his broader calling. Vocation is often seen as how we carry out our calling in practical everyday life. In Genesis 2.15, Adam is placed in the Garden of Eden, Eden to work it and to take care of it. And Paul, Paul in Colossians 3.23 says, whatever you do, work at it with all your heart as working for the Lord, not for human masters. The idea of calling and vocation is often really difficult to distinguish, but Martin Luther in particular, he did a lot of work to redefine vocation accordingly. And he argued that legitimate work is holy if done for God's glory. And I hope what that does for you is it doesn't narrow the scope of vocation for your life, but it actually expands it. That in fact, that God's blessing for your life is not particular to a place or a thing, but it's to a relationship with him that leads to an outpouring of your life to give him glory in whatever you choose to do. God is so gracious in all that he does that in every season of life that we're in, whether or not we feel we're doing exactly what we're wanting to do, when we live in such a way that is to give glory for, to God, it is called holy. That what you're doing right now, I don't know what your job situation is. I don't know if you like your job, if you're already looking for a new job. If you are, God bless. I hope you find the right thing. But know that it does not limit you from giving God glory in the space that you're in. 
That even in a space that is only for a season or only for right now, it is still holy because it is not based upon whether or not you hit the target dead center. Something is called holy because God's presence is there. So when I give glory to God in the spaces that I'm in, in every single space, I'm declaring it's holy. Not by my action, not my ability, not my proficiency, but by simply the presence of God that I invite in because of the way in which I'm giving him glory. And then it is holy. Your workplace, your your preparation, your difficult conversations, your moments of frustration, all of it can be declared holy when we simply invite God to be the way in which we operate. Are you giving God glory in every space that you're in? The answer is no. (laughs) The answer is no for me too. We, we fall short over and over again. But the grace of God is that it, he never runs short. He never stops making himself available. Every space that you're in can be declared holy. And I hope that gives you even a, a divine imagination for what your spaces could be. Maybe you are in a space of immense frustration with your workplace. And you see that there is the way the, the language is, the way that the uh, attitudes are, the way the treatment of one another is. Perhaps the invitation of the season that you're in is to be a beacon in the darkness. To declare the glory of God within it and to call it holy when no one else thought it was. One of the calls that we felt specifically for this place uh, here at HD Stafford. Well, before we, we chose this, we didn't know this. But as we became, became aware of the space, one of the stories about H.G. Stafford is that it was a place of death, it was a place of hurt, it was a place of loss, and it was a place where people did not want to go. And so part of our heart became simply, we're not afraid of what people call this place before because we know what God calls it now. Set apart. Loved, healed, forgiven, all, every bit of it redeemed by the power of Jesus. Not by the presence of a church, but by the power of Jesus that is the presence of God in the space every single day. So as we pray for this place. We pray for this space. We believe that God is at work. Is that something you can do for your spaces? When you ask, does your life matter? Think how much it would matter if the workplace dynamic that you are currently frustrated in would shift. How would it impact others around you, let alone yourself? I believe that as followers of Jesus, we are actually called to live in every vocation that we're in to glorify God and to see the ways in which he calls it holy. But we need a vision that looks like Jesus in order to do this. Because more often than not, my frustration is what drives my vision. My, my hurt or my ignorance or my exhaustion drives my vision. We, Jesus, we need you to invigorate our vision, to see beyond what I'm currently experiencing. And this is part of our purpose. Purpose is about discovering why God created us. And it's not about self-fulfillment, but it's about living according to God's will and making an impact for his kingdom. So let's go back to our idea of the the organization and these three words of calling, of vocation, of purpose. So if calling is this broad invitation from God, it starts with our identity as followers of Christ and includes both general and specific invitations to participate in work. Calling is like, it's like a job offer. It's like receiving a job offer to work for a company. You've been chosen and you've been, been invited to be part of something. Vocation is the specific department or role you've been given within that company. It's your unique tasks and responsibilities in the moment. And the great thing is that there's space to move up. Uh, There's there's space to to try different things. You're not locked into a role forever, but Jesus has an imagination beyond yours for the ways in which you can flourish. And then purpose is in many ways like the mission statement of the company. It's the overall reason it exists and what it seeks to accomplish. And this is, this is the intersection of it all together. Often when we, think of, when we think of vocation and calling, they can run as like these parallel lines side by side. 
when in reality uh, they are these intercrossing pieces that if we are walking in this space of calling, our lives are always meant to be moving upwards and forward towards a purpose of knowing Jesus, being like Jesus. We're moving towards Christ. And then there's this intersection of our career or trying to, trying to figure out what we're supposed to be doing. And it's that, that intersection point that I believe we can find purpose over and over again. That part of your calling, part of your vocation, and then hopefully this part of your passion is found at that intersection. And this is a journey. Hear me on this. This is not an expectation that suddenly you figure it out. But I want you to know that uh, a calling is actually not about simply figuring out what you're supposed to do. Calling is the ongoing process of following Jesus. That in every step, we might find different purpose and different intersections of the ways in which the passions of our life come alive. So if we, if we can hold to that idea that calling is broad, vocation is more specific in what we're doing in the moment, we can call that place holy, and purpose is knowing the heart of God in all things, then I want to look at the passage through this lens. And there's three postures that Jesus takes in the midst of this incredible purpose that he has. And the first thing he has is that calling is rooted in compassion and authority. At the heart of the gospel, especially in Matthew chapter 9, we see this constant theme that Jesus' compassionate response to the brokenness around him is what begins to shift things. He heals the paralytic. He touches the woman suffering from bleeding. He raises a child from the dead. Jesus' ministry is not a spectacle. He asks multiple individuals throughout the narrative not to actually tell people that this is what's been going on. But rather, this is an outpouring of love directed at the most marginalized, broken, and needy. When we think about our calling, we're not simply meant to be thinking about how do I find my specific way that I do things really well. But we are asking to have the heart of God in the way that we live our life. And we're asking, how can I live with the same sense of compassion that Jesus did over and over and over again? Howard Thurman says that the movement of the Spirit of God in the hearts of men often calls them to act against the spirit of their times or causes them to anticipate a spirit which is yet in a making. In, in a world that often rushes past the hurting, we're called to slow down to notice, to extend, and re the restoring touch of Jesus. And I want to put this in context. Like sometimes we can hear that I need to have compassion. We only think about the ways that we do that, maybe on a global scale or in an outreach sense or in a volunteer capacity. The way in which you are compassionate operates within your vocation as well. It's the ability to be present in the current moments that you are in. In your workplace when you walk in, are you inviting the Holy Spirit to give you eyes to see and ears to hear the way that God wants to speak with compassion towards someone in the space that they're in? Maybe they've had a hard, hard day just getting to work. Maybe they've had a brokenness in their family. Maybe they've got a, a, a recent diagnosis that's really brought them down. Maybe they're just feeling broken down by life. There is an opportunity for the compassion of God to touch the compassion in your heart and be the, the foundation for your action that day. This is the posture Jesus took. And he didn't just take it with compassion, but he operated with this authority. The authority that God had given him. Because compassion is not just about feeling. It has to be about action. It's about seeing wounds being healed and people restored. Jesus' healing ministry, and some of you are going to be uncomfortable with this. Jesus' healing ministry is central to understanding your calling. This is what it means, actually, to have the power of God at work in your life. The power of God that is given to his followers, the call and the commissioning of his disciples, that's for you and that's for me. Understanding and seeing Jesus' healing ministry as foundational for our calling is not meant to simply scare us off, but it's meant to call us towards something beyond our own strength and control. So often in our calling, we take ourselves to the final step that I can do. God has called you beyond that. And hear me again. I'm not talking about like the next position in your company. Maybe it is. But I'm talking about the way that you live your life. 
So often when people climb the ladder of success and they get that final position, often the refrain that's communicated at the end when Jesus is not a part of the equation is it has left me unfulfilled. I have found myself lacking. I have found myself longing for more and they, they find themselves falling apart in other areas of their life. The call of your life is beyond what you can do. So we need to see the power at work in Jesus' healing ministry and believe this, it is the same for you. Our calling is to live with a Christ-offered compassion that moves and heals and restores with his authority. And then in Matthew chapter 10, Jesus gives this call, this commissioning to his disciples and he outlines the ways in which the power is going to be at work in their life. And then he also communicates all the ways in which they're going to have to let go of their control and their reliance that you're not going to have silver or gold, leave your backpack behind. You need to simply, he's saying, trust in me. In Matthew 10, verse 9 to 10, Jesus sends out his disciples with the bare minimum. No extra money, no extra clothes, no fallback plan. And it's a directive that makes little sense to our modern ears. Take nothing for your journey, he's saying. And this is a call to radical trust. Trust that God will provide, that the work he has started, he will complete. Dietrich Bonhoeffer, in his classic book, The Cost of Discipleship, reflects on this trust. And he says, when Christ calls a man, he bids him come and die. And it's not necessarily a physical death, but a death to self-sufficiency, to the illusion that we're in control. And in trusting God's provision, we're asked to step away from this mindset of scarcity and enter this life of abundance in Christ. Not measured by possessions, but by the depth of God's care. So our calling is to move from self-sufficiency to God dependence, to find freedom in less, not more. And then finally, calling involves boldness to face rejection and persevere. Jesus, at every turn in his life of miracles, faced incredible opposition, even when good things were happening. It's really important to to note this. Because often when we see that we face opposition, we start to question whether or not we're doing good things. This is a matter of operating with wisdom and having a community to discern alongside. But in these moments in which Jesus is healing the sick, he is doing the impossible He's being questioned at every corner as to his intentions, as to his identity, as to his purpose. And at every junction, he is forced to step forward in boldness. This is part of his necessary posture. Our calling is to trust that our identity is in God and not in how others receive us. So I want you to hear those those few different things that we see within The posture of Jesus in this text. That he has this posture of compassion. He has this posture of trust. And he has this posture of boldness in the life that he lives. Because we learn to live in God's power by learning to live in Christ's posture. Calling means learning to live in God's power by adopting Christ's posture. So often in our Christian walk, we're looking for an exact game plan of how to do something. But I would, I would contend this, that it's not a matter of having the exact game plan in front of us, but it's the, it's the matter of seeing that the most accurate, the most clear, the most presented picture of who God is, is through the person of Jesus. And Jesus lives a life with power at the center of it. And the ways in which he engages with power is dramatically different than what we see in our world. It is not for the purposes of oppression or control, but it's for the purposes of redemption and of healing. And so when we want to live into God's power, we need to guard our hearts from adopting a posture that is not Jesus's. Because we will find power, especially within a North American context. The pursuit of power is often at the forefront of our relationships and interactions. But it always comes at the cost, even if they say, oh, it'll just be like this for a season, of oppression of others and domineering to the point of your elevation and someone's subjugation. 
This is the, this is the framework of power that is so different than the one that Jesus takes. In his power, what does he do? He takes the posture of compassion. I see brokenness. I can't look away. He takes the posture of trust. I don't have all that I see that I need, but I trust that I will. And he takes his posture of boldness. This message is too important to keep to myself. I have to tell the world about it, not just in my words, but in my actions. And I will do so at the cost of someone else's opinion. This is truly living in God's power. To live in God's power is not simply to have, be in a position of authority to make decisions. To live in God's power is to live in such a way that it looks dramatically different than the way of the world. And it begins to look like Jesus in every space. Because every space can be called holy. Compassion and connection. Calling begins when we see the world through God's compassionate eyes. Radical trust. It's not about our capacity. It's about his sufficiency. And may we be bold in all that we do. Matthew 9 and 10 give us a picture of a life that is living in God's power. And my, my challenge to you this morning is that for some of you, you have such a low opinion of yourself, of where you're at and what you're doing, that you do not even believe that the idea of power is something that is available to you. My challenge to you this morning is that Jesus does not believe the same thing. His commission and call that he gives to his disciples, he gives to you. He says, follow me, heal the sick, cast out demons, call, the, call people who are blind to see, those who are deaf to hear. Have my heart of compassion in the world that you go into. And you don't have to do it by your own strength, do it by mine. This is what it is to, to, to give up our life, actually. We have to believe it is of value because he certainly does. We learn to live in God's power by learning to live in Christ's posture. So where, where in that posture do you find yourself lacking? Has your heart been hardened by past experiences and hurts that compassion actually feels like a... Has your, has your life felt like a constant struggle to grab onto the next thing that trust feels like an impossibility? Do you feel the words of others to hold far greater weight than you would even desire? That the idea of boldness makes you sick to your stomach. Wherever it is, we find ourselves lacking because we are all finding ourselves lacking in one space or another. Know this. Jesus wants to meet you there. He wants to be your strength. He wants to be your authority. He wants to be your compassion. He wants to be your trust. He wants to be your boldness. And the beauty of his grace is that we do not have to strive to somehow get him to open up this door and come on in. We can simply say, Jesus, come. So I wonder if you could do that with me this morning. Maybe if we can bow our heads and close our eyes. We're going to take a moment just with, just with the spirit of God working in this space. Maybe you can name for yourself. When you ask the question, does my life matter, what, where in your heart do you find instant pushback? Where, where is the lies of the enemy that would say that you are not enough? We say, come Holy Spirit. We need you to heal us. Maybe as we're talking about this idea of power, your heart is, you're excited about the idea of it. Like, oh, I, I want to live in the power that is promised here in these scriptures. But then when we talk about the posture, you're like, yeah, my, my heart of compassion feels hardened. I don't feel like I can even stretch myself to trust a little bit. And boldness, no, it's not, not, not me right now. Whatever it is, 
we say, come Holy Spirit. Give us a picture of what life looks like with you transforming that. Father, we believe right now that there's just even miracles taking place within our hearts and our minds in this moment. Ways that we have thought of others and ourself are being renewed. Ways in which we see the world and see our current situation being transformed. Our, our stubbornness, our pride, our apathy. Father, I pray that you would invigorate our vision for our lives so that the question of does my life matter is not met with uncertainty, but with an assurance it does because of who you are. And for those longing for clarity, wanting to hear your voice, wanting to hear a call. Help us to be present in this moment, in the moment that we're in. And give us a vision for the future. This is, this is a holy moment. And it's not because you're in church. But it's because you're pausing to invite the presence of God in. So just invite the Holy Spirit for yourself. Maybe it's saying those words out loud, come Holy Spirit. Maybe it's naming where in your life there's a, there's a barrier or a posture that you're uncomfortable with. Name that. Maybe say that out loud for yourself. As we continue to pray, worship team, you can join me at the front. As I was preparing this week, I just felt this, this burning desire in my heart that, uh, that, that, God, that God wanted us to be a people of his power. And it felt like a, felt like a leap to just, just to just be that. How do we get there, oh God? I just felt this like comfort upon my heart And it was just a simple, simple refrain that was brought to my, my heart. Just, just walk with me. Learn to have my compassion by walking with me. Learn to trust by walking with me. Grow in your boldness by walking with me. There is no ju judgment or condemnation for those in Christ Jesus. Rather, he sees you and he loves you. And he says, come with me, follow me. And like those who walked with Jesus in that day, to simply be in his presence was an, was an acceptance of his power. 
So we say, Spirit of God, yeah, where lies are deeply rooted in our hearts and our minds that would wish us to believe less about us than what you believe, we pray that they would be uprooted in Jesus' name. And for the, pre- the posture of Christ that we long to hold, may we learn to live into that as we walk with you. So we pray for opportunities this week. I pray for each person in this room that feels like their compassion is lacking. Give them an opportunity to live with your compassion. For those this week that feel like their trust in you feels limited, they don't really want to stretch, I pray that they have an opportunity to trust in you. And where boldness feels lacking, we pray that the posture that you showed to us would lead us to actually walk in the power that you give to us. So Jesus, we need you. Thank you that there's more for our lives than we could ever imagine. And thank you that we don't do it unequipped or alone, but we do it with you and in community. So give us a vision for the future. Thank you for leading us on this journey. In Jesus' name, amen.